The theologian by the name of John Grondelsky, he wrote a piece about sleep, which got me thinking. There really is something that along the lines of the theology of sleep. Theology, of course, is the study of God. We can study God even in something as regular as going to sleep. So the first thing to keep in mind in tonight's presentation on the theology of sleep is this. The Washington Post just recently put out an article that said that Americans don't get enough sleep. The Post cited research from seven universities, as well as the National Sleep Foundation, the Center for Disease Control and Prevention, and the American Academy of Pediatrics. They all agree that people do not get enough rest. And even when you compare the Gallup polls, the last one done on this particular study was in 2013, Americans on average get about six and a half hours of sleep a night compared to their grandparents' generation in the 1942 poll, which showed that they got eight hours of sleep a night. So here's a question for us then. Aren't we living in a more technologically advanced society? I mean, don't we have more conveniences than they did back in the 1940s? Well, of course we do. But by and large, people back in the 1940s, they wasted very little time yeah, they had the radio and movies as a form of information and entertainment. Not everybody had television just yet, and there certainly was no internet. Most people of today have to admit there's far too much time wasted in our current society in front of screens. And so does all this screen watching affect our sleep? Most studies say it does. In fact, it's almost conclusive. But let's be honest, if you kind of are always filling your head with images and all kinds of different things, messages, and all kinds of different you know, avenues, whether it's entertainment or study, whatever it might be, or sometimes just wasting time. You're taking all that with you as you're trying to go to bed. And like, how many of you have ever done this, okay? Something as simple as just playing a game. Well, I'm just relaxing before I go to bed, I'm just playing a game. Now, of course, for some of you, the game might be blasting zombies, okay, all right? Or it might just be solitaire. But what happens when you didn't make that last level? You got three cards away from hitting it all. You didn't do it. Now, brushing teeth all mad. You're all upset. You're going to bed angry. Or you're going to bed with all these images, all this stimulation. It's hard to gear all of that down, especially if you're going to bed a lot later than you should. But now, how bad is it? Us Americans not getting enough sleep. How bad is it? Some very intensive research done just this past year determined that just here in the U.S., the economy loses about $411 billion a year to lost production hours because people are calling in sick. It's a lot of money. But now don't, sometimes people catch a cold or get the flu. I mean, aren't there good reasons to call in sick? Well, yes, but a whole lot of people call in sick because they're simply too tired to go to work. But here's something else to consider. But though some scientists will differ a little bit on the numbers, basically when you fall asleep at night, it's very beneficial to fall into something they call REM sleep, rapid eye movement sleep. The type of sleep where you fall deep into a sleep pattern and you begin to dream. That's what we're searching for. Now the REM sleep, REM sleep, comes in 90 minute cycles throughout the night. So, if you know you're not going to get a full night's sleep for whatever reason, we'll talk about some of those in a bit, try at least to sleep according to those 90 minute patterns. Like for example, it's much better to get four and a half hours of sleep rather than five. If you add another 90 minute cycle to that, six hours of sleep is better than five and a half, or even six and a half, which is what most Americans are getting. See, most Americans are waking up in the middle of this sleep cycle. So they feel kind of, not refreshed, but out of it. If at all possible, though, keep this in mind. Obviously, just do the math. The 90-minute cycles occur at one and a half hours, three hours, four and a half, six hours, and seven and a half hours. If at all possible, try to get seven and a half hours of sleep. This ties the whole thing of health and missing work. Because the final 90-minute cycle of sleep, from six to seven and a half hours, is the one that replenishes your immune system. So if you're not getting seven and a half to eight hours of sleep, if you're only getting six hours of sleep, as most Americans do, your immune system is running on empty most of the time. 
Now the exceptions, of course, are for the elderly. Those in the late 80s and 90s, they don't need a lot of sleep at night. But then let's be honest, but for those who are in their advanced years, what are they doing throughout the day? Taking naps, right? So not getting all in one chunk, but they are getting their sleep in, okay? The other exception comes oftentimes with high schoolers for a chunk of time, not, not years, but usually months, even just several weeks, where they're going through a growth spurt. And they need nine hours of sleep. But for the most part, it's seven and a half is probably the range because of these cycles, especially that last one, because of our immune system. So if we're going to be healthy and productive, well then maybe we should seek the one who made us this way, God. So thus here then is the theology of sleep. Now yes, we as Americans, we're constantly being bombarded by information, that which we have to pay attention to for work or study, or stay on top of the news, but as you mentioned earlier, there's plenty of that which is really is a waste of time. But our minds, and sometimes even our emotions, depending on what we're watching, okay, are terribly restless, especially when we're getting ready for bed. And we're surrounded all day by so much noise. It's terribly difficult to quiet things down when we do have to go to sleep. Now, as John Grondelsky points out as a theologian, he has no doubt that there are scientific, neurological, even psychological reasons why people don't get enough sleep. But he thinks, and I totally agree, the number one reason why people in our society have insomnia is a lack of trust. It's hard to sleep when you don't trust. There's a lot of things in our world today we simply do not trust. And sometimes there's some very good reasons. But, as Grondelsky puts it, we have a crisis of faith in God's providence. Now, you can't assume anymore that people know these particular terms. So what is providence besides a city in Rhode Island? Oh, well, that's a team that has the friars, right? Okay, it's so no more than that, okay. Providence is the wisdom, the care, and the guidance as given to us by God. Wisdom, care, guidance, all that's providence. Now, God is God. There's no way he's stopping to give us providence. He's not withholding his help from us. He's always pouring out his love, graces, and so forth. The problem, however, more and more people don't believe that he is there constantly to help them. Now, part of why people don't trust in God, number of reasons, okay? Not the least of which is, unfortunately, economic. It's true, a lot of people are struggling financially, even those who are making some good money. Why? For so many people are stuck with a never-ending quest for more. For more of what? More of what we need? Oh no. More of what we want. Well, Father, my daughter, she wants that particular iPad. It has to be that model. Does it really? Or my wife, she wants this particular vacation here, okay? That particular vacation? Come to find out, I'm drinking the wrong, the wrong type of water bottle. Man, I gotta get this one over here, okay? It can be nuts. And of course, who taps into that? Everywhere. The advertisers, right? Everywhere you turn, there's advertisers. Can you play your game? Boom, another ad? What's going on around here, all right? All this is stimulation to get you what you want. But here's the thing. Do I really need this? Is the question. A lot of people need to start asking a lot more often. Do I really need this? Because the quest for all sorts of stuff, trying to get all these things, trying to make all these people happy as well as yourself, it keeps a lot of people up at night. And why? Why? Or if you're a student, how many things run through your mind, through your head at night, things that affect the way that you may see God and to see if he's really not trustworthy? Yeah, you have your future, but if it changed all of a sudden, but if you and your high school sweetheart suddenly broke up, well, now what? Okay, I left home to be with this guy, man, and I, what, am, what am I supposed to do? Or what if your major changes? It's like, oh man, this, is, this path you thought you were on, you're now over here. But here's what complicates things, especially for students. Why do you spend so much time wasting time and not on homeworks or projects? Oh, because when I get away from the class, I gotta chill, I gotta unwind, I gotta relax, and so forth. Okay, that's fine. But the thing though is this. And I'm not making this up. I hear confessions. You guys know that, right? I hear confessions, okay? Every now and then I'll hear someone say, 
and this is, I, I, I've told you this before in talks, if you confess to wasting time, God love you, because hardly anybody does that, and we all do that, okay? And I've had a couple, not too, uh, not too long ago, they went to bed at 4 o'clock in the morning, even though they had to be at class at 9, after spending all night binge-watching on Netflix. And they were upset, at the beginning of confession, at God. Okay? God's messing with my life, man, I'm so like, wait, wait, did God put a gun to your head or have St. Michael come and stick a spear in you to make you watch all night, whatever the heck you were watching? I don't think so. Okay? We tend to go way, way too much with the media, all right? God's not the one to blame. Because here's the thing. Everybody talks about having balance in our lives, right? Balance in our work, our prayer, our study, our exercising, how we eat, in our sleep. But do we really strive for balance? No. No, hardly any of us really strives for balance. Most people don't. So here's where good theology kicks in. What is it that so many people are killing themselves for? Now many of you, I guarantee you, are not doing this because you, you've seen the light, so to speak. You really are trying to become a saint. You're really trying to detach from some of these things. But way too many people are desperately trying to be in control. In control. Now, being disciplined is a good virtue. But whose commands are you following? Yours or God's? At critical moments in our lives, especially when having all sorts of trouble sleeping, the veil we pushed away from what we thought was reality, we realize just how much we are not in control. And guess what? Sleep runs counter to being in control. You're not in control when you sleep. You're going to drool, you're going to drool, baby. Okay? You're out of control when you sleep, all right? And you get right down to it. That's a very real reason why so many people are not getting enough sleep because they're fighting God for the control of their lives. It's amazing how they just can't let go of that. Well, the French Catholic writer, Charles Peggy, he died in the early 20th century. He wrote a very interesting tribute to sleep. He was a great writer of poetry, and here he's speaking in the voice of God, okay? He's reflecting on human behavior, a bit of sarcasm, a bit of humor, there's always plenty of love. Now, true, Peggy was a very good and holy man. He just might have gotten some of these, or all of these thoughts from God himself. But even if he did it, even if he just speculated what God would have said, this poem contains some very thought-provoking statements. So here is the poem, Sleep, by Charles Peggy. Remember, this is God talking, okay? And yet they tell me, there are men who don't sleep. I don't like the man who doesn't sleep, says God. Sleep is the friend of man. Sleep is the friend of God. Sleep may be my most beautiful creation, and I too rested on the seventh day. He whose heart is pure sleeps, and he who sleeps has a pure heart. This is the great secret of being as infatigable as a child, to have that strength in your legs that a child has, those new legs, those new souls, to start over every morning, always new, like the young, like the new hope. Yes, they tell me there are men who work well, who sleep poorly, who don't sleep. What a lack of confidence in me. It's almost worse than if they work poorly but slept well, than if they didn't work but didn't sleep, because sloth is no worse sin than anxiety. In fact, it's even a less serious sin than anxiety, and than despair, and than a lack of confidence in me. I'm not talking, says God, about those men who don't work and don't sleep. Those men are sinners, it goes without saying. I'm talking about those who work and who don't sleep. I pity them. I hold it against them. A bit. They don't trust me. A child lays innocently in his mother's arms, thus they do not lay innocently in the arms of my providence. They have the courage to work. They don't have the courage to do nothing. They possess the virtue of work. They don't possess the virtue of doing nothing, of relaxing, of resting, of sleeping. Unhappy people, they don't know what's good. Terribly interesting poem. So a couple of lines to point out here from this, uh, I think it's just great insight here. He whose heart is pure sleeps. 
He who sleeps has a pure heart. The two feed each other. If your heart is pure, in other words, you have nobody to convict you, to accuse you, go to bed, knock yourself up, right? You're not going to be worried about anything. At the same time, a good sleep makes your heart pure because it gives you everything you need, even physically, to keep up that purity of intention. So the two feed each other. But next, this is an interesting thing where God says, you know, I don't, I don't like a man who doesn't sleep. Sleep is a friend of man. Sleep is a friend of God. Now, of course, God loves all of us. He sent his son, Lord Jesus, to die for us. So basically these words show that God can be disappointed in us if we don't trust him enough. But how about that line? They have the courage to work. They don't have the courage to do nothing. Well, let's un unpack that one. American culture is so influenced by the obsession we are defined by what we do. So we have to do, keep doing, keep doing. But part of what we do, a third of our lives, is to sleep. Sleep is part of what we do. But we don't have the capacity to do nothing because we have forgotten what it's like to sleep like a child in his father's arms. You see, God rested on the seventh day not because he was tired. He did so to admire his work, which of course included you. How come we don't take the time to sit back and just admire? We never take time to do the things that just stop and appreciate. What are we supposed to admire? Well, how about God's work in creation? How about his work? We, we tend to, we fail, quite frankly, to admire this next point. How about his work in recreation? What's recreation? Well, how about our conversion? Or the person we've been praying for is coming back to church. Recreation. That's some beautiful work that God does there. Or how about the work of others? And of course, in our own work. See, we feel guilty sometimes about resting. Some of us feel guilty about using our vacation time. We've also forgotten, though, that the seventh day is an essential truth of being human. We need our rest. And we need our rest in God. As a theologian, John Brondelsky very wisely points out, he says this, we think 24-7, 365 represents progress. There's nothing so advanced as being able to buy the next thing I don't need. At 2.43 a.m. on a Sunday morning, have it delivered by breakfast just because I can. That's not progress. That's not someone who can do nothing. You always have to do this. You always have to do move that mouse or whatever. You're not doing nothing. Get to the point, once again, be able to just calm and all down. Just be in the presence of God. And what about the line in that poem that says, there are men who work well and sleep poorly, who don't sleep. What a lack of confidence in me. Do we not trust that God will give success to the work of our hands? He promises that to us. But what do we fail to realize? God does not promise that to us if we've been working ourselves to death. Because what are the questions? Do we not hope? Or do we not believe? See, that's the thing. Do we not in the end believe that God cares enough for us we can leave everything into his hands? All of our affairs we can leave into his hands and go get some sleep. Do we believe that or not? Do we hope in him or not? Because if you do, he will indeed bless the work of your hands. So, what about you here tonight? Do you believe in a creator who governs? Do you believe in a God who sustains the creation? Because remember, we're Catholics, we're not deists. A deist thinks that there is a God, but once upon a time he made the universe and wound it up like a clock, and just left it to run blindly without ever really caring about any of us. Well, that's not the God we believe in. We believe in a God who's so powerful, he created the universe out of nothing, but one who is so caring, he knows every single detail about your life, exactly the things that are keeping you up at night. So do you believe in God's providence? So to sleep then is to have confidence in God, is to have hope, is to believe. Because remember that great story from the Gospels when the storm hit the boat and there's all the apostles? And remember all but Matthew are very experienced fishermen and they're freaking out. 
Lord, do you not care that we're going to die? We're, we're all going to die. And there you are, asleep in the boat. And one of the great details of the gospel, it says he has a cushion even, man. He is like all comfy, and these guys are ready to die, all right? And so the thing is, is this. Jesus is the source of all hope. So no wonder he can sleep, because when he awakens, the storms in our lives calm down because of his command. We have to be able to become just as hopeful. See, he who doesn't sleep well is unfaithful to hope. Keep that in mind. God's working with you to become hopeful. If you're fighting him in your sleep, you're not being faithful to hope. Remember, whatever I taught you, what is hope? Is Jesus telling you, it's going to be okay. It's going to be all right. That's what hope is. Be faithful to that. But now let's take a look at this whole notion of sleep from some from different perspectives here, okay? Here's a question that many people may never have even thought about. It's a good question, though. Why did God design us to need sleep? He could have made us any way he wanted to. We sleep a third of our lives. Now just think about that for a second. If you live to be 99 years old, you slept for 33 years. That's a lot of sleep, baby, okay? A third of your, 33 years, you, you, 33 years you spent like a dead person, okay? 33 years like that, okay? All right? Well, there's a correlation between sleep and death, which we'll talk about in just a minute. But think about everything we could have done, which was left undone, because we had to go to bed. There's no doubt that God could have created us without any need for sleep. And just think, everyone could have had two careers and not feel tired. We could do our jobs, but also work for it full time for the church. I mean, so much we could have accomplished. So why did God set up sleep for us? Because after all, he never sleeps. The angels, unfortunately the demons, they never sleep. So how can we have to? Psalm 127 verse 2, it tells us, It is vain that you rise up early, go late to rest, eating the bread of anxious toil, for he gives to his beloved in his sleep. Did you catch that? He, God, gives to his beloved, you guys, in your sleep. There are things that God wants to give you, but only in your sleep. Not the least that wishes your immune system back, okay? So all kinds of stuff he wants to give you. So according to the psalm, sleep is a gift of love. How do you like that? Sleep is a gift of love. But that gift, if it's not accepted, because we're all worried and anxious, can't fall asleep in the first place, you're not opening up the gift. It's actually pretty simple if you think about it. God does not want his children to be anxious and all caught up in worry and despair, but to trust him. You see, we should not be anxious about anything. We should be able to rest in him. And that's what we tend to forget, right? So we're not just laying our weary head down on the pillow at night because we're just too exhausted to do anything else. But rather, when we go to sleep, we are preparing to rest in Him, in our mighty yet gentle Father. That's why, this is very important, sleep is a daily reminder from God that we're not God. Psalm 121, verse 4. Behold, he who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. So God does not sleep because he is constantly watching out over us. But we will sleep. Why? Because we're not God. It's just that simple. In fact, a preacher once put it this way. Once a day, God sends us to bed like patients with a sickness. The sickness is a chronic tendency to think that we're in control and that our work is indispensable. To cure us of this disease, God turns us into helpless sacks of sand once a day. Yes, even the richest man in the world, the most powerful person who controls so much of everything, has to give up total control of everything for several hours, become as harmless as a baby nursing at his mother's breast. That's why sleep is actually a very wise and valuable teaching that God is God and we're just mere mortals. You see, don't forget, God handles the world quite nicely while the entire hemisphere sleeps. It's when us humans wake up that things become crazy and dysfunctional. 
Sleep is a continual daily message that tells us what? Man is not sovereign. Man is not in control. God is. So try to remember that. That God is not so much impressed with your late nights and early mornings as he is impressed with that peaceful trust, just like a child, that throws everything aside, all the worries, all the cares, all the anxieties, so you can be able to rest in him. That is what impresses him. So tonight we go to bed. I'm going to sleep good, baby, because I'm not God, man. So you take care. I'm going to bed, man. So that will that, conk you out in a hurry there, okay? But this ties in very nicely to that famous story of Pope St. John the Twenty-Third. See, when John the Twenty-Third first became Pope, the world was going crazy. Late 50s, early 60s, here comes communism, the sexual revolution, all kinds of madness. He was being overwhelmed. It's like, man, what did I sign up for here, okay? So he wrote down his journal, speaking to himself. Now keep in mind, John the Twenty-Third, his given name was Angelo. Okay, that was his name. So he wrote in his journal, But who is it that rules the church? Is it you, Angelo, or is it the Holy Spirit? Well, then, Angelo, if it's the Holy Spirit, go to sleep. I feel as if I were an empty bag that the Holy Spirit unexpectedly fills with strength. What a great, great quote, because it shows us we have to trust that God will take care of everything in order for us to be filled with strength, the strength of the Holy Spirit, by the way, for the next day's work, we have to become those empty bags. That's what happens when we go to sleep. You're an empty bag, you wake up in the morning, you're good to go. That's how it's supposed to work. You're fighting with God to struggle with him. what goes in the bag. You're not going to sleep, you're not going to be any good that following day. But now, since us humans have a lot to to be about when it comes to balance, because we tend to get things out of whack so easily. We can't overdo things either, right? You get that seven and a half, eight hours of sleep, but as St. Philip Neri, who warned us, we shouldn't spend too much time sleeping, because heaven, as he said, is not for sluggards. Yeah, I love that word, man, sluggard. Okay, you sluggard, okay? Well, what does that mean? Sluggard simply means Someone who does not want, in fact, does whatever he can to avoid work, especially hard work. That's a sluggard. So sometimes we have a tendency to stay in bed because we don't want to face the work of the day. Okay? I mean, you just broke your snooze button. You hit it the 23rd time. Oh, okay, there it goes, all right? So Philip Neary, he refers to the book of Proverbs. So in Proverbs chapter 6, verse 9, we read, how long will you lie there, O sluggard? It's out of the Bible. That word sluggard is in the Bible, okay? <laughs> when will you arise from your sleep? Can you just imagine God at you? When are you going to rise from your sleep, man? we got stuff to do here, okay? I tried to fill you last night, but there you were all wasting time on Netflix. You can go back to 3.30, okay? You're a sluggard. You don't got telling you you're a sluggard, okay? And so the thing is, is this. Why then should we spend so much time sleeping, okay? but not too much time sleeping. Because sloth, as we know, is a sin. Keep this in mind, it's part of the theology of sleep. Sleeping is not just an act of hope, where God telling you it's going to be okay. That's where we place everything in God's hands, right? But sleeping is also an act of faith. Faith that God will give us all that we need for the new day's work. But also, Every time you go to bed, we entrust to God, we'll wake up the next day. There's an awful lot of faith in the act of going to bed. Like, remember that venerable childhood prayer? I still say it. Now I'll lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. If I should die before I wake... Whoa, 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 I should die? Well, wait a minute, man. Well, no wonder I can't get any sleep, okay? <laughs> Okay, calm down, calm down, calm down. God is still in control because each night is an anticipation of the day when we will never wake up on this side of eternity again. One of these days, we'll close our eyes for the last time on this side and open them up on the other. But like the author and professor Peter Kraft puts it, death is just simply God tucking you in at night preparing you for a glorious new day. It's beautiful. That's also why the church's Liturgy of the Hours, the night prayer that many of us pray, 
Sleep and death are correlated, they're interconnected. May the Lord give us a restful night and a peaceful death. So, if you are used to God tucking you in at night, every night, you'll be more than ready when he tucks you in one final time to prepare you for eternity. So let him tuck you in, man. Oh man, I'm like 67 years old. I'm like, you got, yeah, you, yeah, you do need God to tuck you in. It's preparing you for death, man. So get used to it. Let him do that for you, okay? This is also why for the Christian, going to sleep is a beautiful act of faith, which is why part of our night prayers should include an examination of conscience. But before we get to that, though, before we get to the examination of conscience, what about do you guys pray before you actually conk out? Okay? Many people do. Many people fall asleep in the middle of their prayers, okay? But don't forget to pray something along this line here, okay? It's a beautiful prayer here to let you know you're in good hands. Bless, O Lord, the rest I'm going to take in order to renew my strength, that I may be better able to serve you. All you angels and saints, especially my guardian angel and blessed Mary, Mother of God, intercede for me this night and during the rest of my life, but especially at the hour of my death. Amen. So it's a beautiful prayer because it echoes the petition of the Hail Mary, you know, pray for us sinners now at the hour of our death. See, we ask Mary, the angels and the saints, to pray for us when we no longer can because we're asleep. See, you're always being watched over. An angel, saints, Mary is always watching over you, along, of course, with God. Now, don't be getting all crazy with your, you know, well, come on, Father. Mary and the saints, man, that's like, that's like a billion people that got to watch at one time. They don't sleep. And they're in eternity. That ain't, that's not a problem for them. They have no problem watching over every single one of you. Let them do that. They're watching over you as you're able to let go and go to sleep. So since sleep and death are so closely related, taking the snooze is actually a practice for the day, like I mentioned, will go from this life to the next. That's why we have to be able to be ready to go from this life to the next, the examination of conscience. Now many people just right before going to bed, it's very good practice, but if you're falling asleep before you do the examination of conscience, Really simple fix. Really simple. People ask me all, all the time, Father, I want to do a good examination, but you know something? I'm just so sleepy, I just conk out. Well, do it when you're brushing your teeth, man. <laughs> just knock it back for 10 minutes. How hard is that? Oh, yeah, oh, yeah that one too. Okay, yeah. I mean, come on. It's not that hard, but get it in. Or, if you're just so super distracted at night, then do your examination of conscience at noon or in the afternoon. Okay? But do it. Uh, you know, on a kind of regular basis. And once again, real quickly, what's the examination do? That's where we ask Almighty God to help us see what we've done well, or not so well, to see where we loved, or not so loved, either God or our neighbor, what we've done badly, what we could have done better. So we ask for the forgiveness of our sins and for the grace to do better the following day, if God so graciously blesses us with such. Remember, when you wake up in the morning, you thank God for granting you another day. Don't you even think about taking those toes out of the bed until you say a prayer of thanksgiving first. Okay? You're not, you're not getting out until you say a prayer. Because that way, you begin the day in prayer, you end the day in prayer, the whole thing is covered in prayer. Okay. Here are now some very practical approaches to take. First. It's perfectly normal, and many of you know this, to wake up in the middle of the night at least once. It's perfectly normal. Sometimes you have to go to the bathroom, okay? Sometimes a dog next door woke us up. But if you happen to wake up and it feels like something else, like, wait a minute, what was this? It's because it is something else. It, for example, you happen to wake up tonight at 1.37 in the morning, wondering, hmm, why am I awake? Well, don't worry about it. Causes all kinds of anxiety. Oh man, okay. Somebody ask God, okay, Lord, I'm awake, it's 137. Is there something or someone you want me to pray for? Okay, who needs the prayers, Lord? Because you woke me up for some reason, okay? Now, if it's just that extra piece of pizza you had at 9 30 before going to bed, God will tell you, no, no, no. Just go take some time to go back to sleep. You're okay, all right? But as we know, the most of the world sleeps at night. Life does not cease during those sleepy hours. People are going to the emergency room. Mothers are delivering children. Police are responding to a break-in. The homeless are trying to survive. 
And of course, there are those out there who are having a terrible try time trying to get to sleep. So if God wants you to pray for someone at that time, well then do so. Then be content that God has used you in such a way. Thank Him. Thank you, Lord, for using me that way. Go back to sleep. Confident that God trusts in you as you trust in Him to finish off your sleep. All right? So don't be freaking out. Oh, why am I? Okay, who needs the prayers, Lord? Okay. And even if you have no clue, that prayer isn't wasted. It'll go exactly to whoever needs that prayer. All right? Offer just a few Hail Marys. Boom, you know it's going to be taken care of. And then, of course, go back to sleep. Second practical point. Every now and then, especially if you're going through some, some tough times, with all this work to do, all these decisions to make, all these plans, and we're just like super busy, we're like spread so thin, God, our Lord Jesus, He'll wake us up in the middle of the night. Especially, if you guys ever notice this, during the three o'clock hour. Happens a lot. Now don't fall for this nonsense, because I really believe it's nonsense, that some people say that the 3 a.m. hour is the hour of deception. It's opposite of 3 p.m., the hour that Jesus died. God doesn't care if 3 o'clock is 3 o'clock. Besides, it's 3 p.m. somewhere. 3 o'clock is Trinitarian. And I, I can give you a thousand stories how God's woken me up at 3 o'clock hour to give me all kinds of stuff, all right? Well, why does he do that? Like a real quick example. My first year as a priest, and I told you this story before, they were given to me, because the other priest didn't want it, okay, a murder-suicide. A husband shot his wife and then shot me. I had that funeral, okay? I'm, I'm not going to preach at that funeral. I'm a brand new priest now, okay? I've got some life experience, but wow. The, the two days before the funeral, trying to go to sleep, 3.15, Jesus wakes me up. So he's feeding me this, all this stuff. He said, well, get up, write this down. Okay, yeah, that, yeah, Lord, okay, boom, boom, boom. Okay? It was 4.10, so almost an hour. There it was, there was a homily. And so when we did have the funeral the day after, people go, Father, it was like, you knew us. It was like, perfect. You know, he knew you. And so keep this in mind. When you're awake during the day, gotta be honest, right? You're not exactly too prone to listen to Jesus. Because of all the distractions, all the thousands of voices trying to get our attention, so sometimes Jesus will wake us up in the middle of the night because he knows you're not going to fight him at 320. You're too busy like, huh? Well, well, okay, all right? He's pretty clever that way. He's very clever that way because we're out of it. But he wakes up our minds a little bit, our souls, and then he gives us what we need to take care of the to-do list, the thing you've been worried about. Oh, wow, there's the answer. Thank you, Lord, okay? Okay, there it is. Now go back to sleep. He does it a lot. Because he couldn't get your attention at 4.10 or at 12.20 during the day. So don't be surprised if he does it during the 3 o'clock hour. Third, there will be times because of sickness, either for ourselves or others, or sometimes crazy things happen, okay? Like I told you this, it happened right around Christmas time, getting ready to go to bed, okay? And so, all set, ready to go, and I'm exhausted, all right? And I go to sleep, and it's like, how come my pillow is wet? And I look up and my ceiling is dripping. Oh man, okay. So I gotta take all the, you know, go make another bed in the other room and so forth. But the other bedroom is the closest one to the parking lot. And for some reason, the fraternity boys are having a party that night. So it's like, oh, I'm not gonna sleep. I'm, not, I'm just not gonna sleep that night, okay. It happens, right? So what do you do when you know, not gonna happen tonight, man, okay. Number one, don't panic. Don't think, oh man. I'm, I'm going to pass out at Mass tomorrow. I'm going to pass out at work, okay? Calm down. God is your strength. If you know you're going to have a rough night because the kids or your friends or your loved ones are just driving you nuts, you can't sleep, you're so worried about them, don't be worried, God will take care of them. Or, more than likely for many of you, especially you women, you're during a vigil because one of your friends is in the ER or one of the kids is in trouble or one of the grandkids didn't come home that night. Oh man, so you got the rosary, man. Here you go. You're not going to sleep that night. And so allow your heart and soul to be comforted by the Lord because He'll give you spiritual rest. See, as we've been talking about tonight, physical rest is essential, but even more so is the spiritual rest that God always provides. Even though you make me know this night, I'm not going to sleep much because of this crisis or trial. But you don't have to be all to pieces. 
because that great peace of our Lord Jesus, his great presence, will keep you calm and keep you strong. So don't forget, he's suffering with you. Those crazy kids you're worried about, he's worried about them too. So you can comfort him as he's comforting you. Don't forget that aspect as well. Fourth, what about those nightmares? Let's briefly break this down because this is a, actually, quite frankly, another Bible study. Maybe I will give you a little class on dreams. But if you're a good and practicing Christian, that's all of you here tonight, I would imagine. You're good at practicing, doing the best you can, be the best Catholic you can be. Someone's really trying to let the Lord Jesus be the Lord of your life. There is no way Jesus is going to let Satan into your subconscious. Jesus is not going to let Satan into your dreams. Oh, man, the devil's in my dreams, man. Okay, no, it wasn't the devil. You think Jesus is going to let him in? It doesn't work that way. But, true, some dreams are indeed scary. They can shake us up. It's not the devil. Because remember, the devil's not God. The devil can't read your mind. He doesn't know what you're thinking. Only God does. So the devil has no idea what's going through your subconscious. So he cannot directly enter into your subconscious where dreams primarily come from. But now true, be aware of this now, the two areas where the devil can plant seeds to shake us up a bit, memory and imagination. Now memories, of course, of the events in our lives that are public, so to speak. Memories of things that happened that other people could see. So the devil can use those to accuse us and try to keep us bound, all right? So always let the Lord heal and clean up any difficult memories from the past. Don't be stuck in a memory that our Lord Jesus heal you of that. You know, un un unbound you from that, okay? But second, the devil can influence our imagination. Imagination provides a lot of material, if not most, for our dreams. So always have to be careful what you're bringing into yourself through your eyes and through your ears. The music you listen to, the videos you watch, the movies you take into, all of you can affect you massively. The devil can plant a lot of seeds there. You take care of that, but also let God take care of your memories, there's very little, if any, chance the devil can get inside your mind. So rather those images in a nightmare are either you from the depth of your subconscious or God himself trying to get your attention. And especially about something particular in your life that you're trying to figure out. Because just about every single time you have a nightmare, it's rather about healing. Nothing to be scared about. I've dealt with this with so many people over the years. It's about healing. So here's some examples, okay? You be joyful instead of being fearful. Here's the first example. This one woman had this reoccurring dream where there was this picture frame and a little girl inside the picture, just her face. And the girl would talk to her and disturb her, saying, free me, let me go, let me be. She would try to ignore the picture, but the picture would show up in, in her dream, at school, or maybe she was shopping, here comes this picture, it was like the kid following her, let me go, let me be. And finally she got to the point she just couldn't take it anymore, she, she grabbed the picture frame and shattered it, and the little face of the girl became the full girl, her body, and that little girl ran away, all excited and joyful and happy. When we broke that one down, it's very, very simple. We were able to kind of go a little bit deeper, come to find out the girl in that picture frame was a girl that she had terribly teased when she was younger. She was horrible to that little girl. And so what she was dealing with all those years in that picture frame was shame and guilt. And so the healing that God wanted her to have came when she broke that picture frame. That little girl was free. That memory was free. And so was this woman. So it wasn't a nightmare. She was being healed. Here's another one. I've had this about three or four times that people have dealt with, so it's, it's kind of common because unfortunately sexual abuse is common. This one, this one gal was telling me about she had a, a horrific dream because she was uh, sexually abused when she was a teenager. And in the dream, the man who abused her was sleeping right next to her in a dream. She could feel him, just freaked her out. Next thing you know, he's getting up and she's about ready to cry out Jesus, but she can't, like the word Jesus is stuck in her throat. But suddenly here come these men into the room. They grab this guy and throw him out. 
And at first she's pretty disturbed. What, is it going to come back? Are they, are they going to do something to me? And then she would wake up, you know, terrified. So as you broke down that dream, we came to see, because you can go, you go layers in your dream, okay? At first, the men who came in to the guy, to the abuser, she identified as her brothers, who always kind of took care of her. But then she said, okay, let's go a little deeper, some of the uh, things she was getting, and suddenly she said, wait a minute, I think those might have been angels to have come and to take him out. And then a little bit deeper, she began to find a way, but one of them, I think one of them was Jesus. And so this horrific nightmare turned out to be, no, another powerful healing. Jesus was saying, that man, I'm throwing him out of your life forever. That memory would not have you bound anymore. And so nightmares are actually ways that God wants to heal you. So don't be afraid of them, but at the same time, you protect yourself you know, by what you're coming into your eyes and your ears, your imagination, okay? And let God take care of those memories. But there really is no such thing as a nightmare if you're a true practicing Christian. So be at ease with that. You say, good Lord, what are you trying to tell me? All right? And of course, talk it out. Talk it out for those that you, that you fully trust. Nine times out of ten, it's God who's trying to heal you. The one time out of ten, it's just your imagination just, just doing, trying to get your attention as far as that goes. Okay? And finally, you must be sure that even the most mortified of saints, the most strict of those saints, okay, who just ate, ate like bread and water, okay, they were as glad to go to, to go to bed as we are now. And so St. Philip Neri, once again, he said something wonderful. He said, when a man really loves God, he comes to such a state in the end, he's obliged to say, Lord, let me get some sleep. This is almost always the case that we've been talking about tonight, sleep being no exception. It's all about love. It's all about love. You're working hard, your evangelization, your patience, your kindness, your forgiving. God wants to reward you. He rewards you in all kinds of blessings, both in this life and life to come. But in this life, part of those blessings is in your sleep. Don't forget a good night's sleep is part of the reward God wants you to have for being a good Christian. Okay? And one of the Psalms has this verse, the saints shall be joyful on their beds. And that refers to paradise. Then one of the other Psalms, David says, I have remembered thee, O Lord, upon my bed. Remember God upon your bed with confidence, with joy, knowing God will always remember you upon that same bed. God bless. We'll see you guys next time.